But at times we have to un oh, so close. <laughs> Hey everybody, it is late at night and I am Norman, so let us begin. As watch nerds, er, enthusiasts, for most of us, our collections are in a state of constant churn. Our tastes change over time, a new watch might actually change our opinion of the watches that we already own, and there's always new amazing pieces coming out. So not only are we buying new watches, but at times, we have to offload some watches as well, which means it's inevitable. We're going to have regret. However, in tonight's video, I don't want to discuss regret, but rather sadness. I want to talk about four watches that I'm still sad that I sold. I don't regret selling them. There was good reason to do so. But when I see these watches, I'm still sad that I had to get rid of them. To be honest with you, there's only one watch that I regret selling, and that is the SKX007. Shortly after I sold it, that line was discontinued, and had I known how soon that was going to take place, I would have held on to the watch just to keep my eye on the market and their value over time. So let's begin looking at four watches that I'm sad that I had to sell. The first watch on my list is the Genoa Ocean Rover. And like I said, I had a reason to sell each of these watches. Jeannot is controversial. I knew that going into it. I had heard that the owner used to make fakes. And so in my head, I'm envisioning a guy honing his skills, modding watches, deciding, oh, I wonder if I could pull off a fake Rolex, make one for himself, his friends, he gets really good, he blows up, and then he leaves all that behind and starts a legitimate company. So naive of me. Genot quality fakes require components sourced from CD operations all over the world. It's not just a guy in a basement. Furthermore, I thought the owner had left his CD pass behind him, but had he? I was getting tired of all the hate every time I posted a picture of a watch that I bought legitimately from a US company. Then I found out that the owner is still selling fakes and that my watch was not just a super well done homage, but it was actually made with some of the same components that he was using on fakes that he was still selling. Nevertheless, there's a reason I bought the Ocean Rover. It is an amazing mill sub watch. If I were to take my favorite aesthetics from historical to modern Submariners and mash them all together into one watch, it would look like the Juno Ocean Rover. But ultimately, it's a fake, so I sold it. The next watch on my list is the Marathon G-SAR. Marathons are such amazing watches. The crown on the G-SAR is so great, the knurling on it is phenomenal. And the dial, oh, it was actually the dial that kept catching my eye every time a G-SAR would come through my social feeds. And those tritium tubes, they were actually pretty bright in spite of what people say about them. And how great is it that they're just constantly glowing? And the tank tread edge on the bezel? The GSAR is just a beast of a watch. But it just sat in the watch box. I almost had to force myself to wear it because even though it was so cool, I was generally more in the mood to wear my smaller dressier watches. And I felt bad. A watch like that should not sit in a box. It should be worn and utilized. It should get wet and muddy and be used as the work watch that it was intended to be. So I sold it. The next item on my list is the Rosling & Co Metropolitan. And what's sad about this watch is its potential. If only companies like Rosling & Co would go just a little bit further, they could truly make something great. I see this so often with startups and micro brands what am I talking about? Let's look at the Metropolitan. It has great mid-century aesthetics. The handset is great, 
The seconds hand is amazing. The case shape, domed sapphire crystal, everything is just dialed in. But on a black dial minimalist dress watch, you put a white background date window? That is not okay. The 40 millimeter case size is all right, but I feel like 37 or 38 would have been even better. And lightweight dress watches are not conducive to the loud, rattling, spinning rotor that's on Miyota Movements. Perhaps offering a Salita hand winder, yeah, the watch would be more expensive, but it would really elevate it. Or perhaps give customers options, different movement type, different case size, date, no date, that would be cool. Ultimately, it was the loud rattling movement and that date window that just was too much, so I sold the watch to go after a Nomos or a Stova. But every now and then I still visit their site just to see if they've taken it to the next level. And if they ever do, I just might own another Rosling & Co watch. The last watch on my list is the Turquoise Base watch. And this one's a little bit different. I had this watch a long time ago, way before I was collecting watches in earnest. So my memory's a little bit fuzzy, but I'm pretty sure that I actually owned a Turquoise Bay, as opposed to borrowing one from a friend. I really loved swatches back in their heyday, and actually I still do, but the Turquoise Bay was the coolest swatch I ever encountered. I love how sci-fi it looks. It's like having Tomorrowland on your wrist. Nevertheless, at some point along the way, I parted ways with the Turquoise Bay, and I'm sad that I don't have one. Yes, you can find them still, but they are not cheap. However, at some point I may have to pull the trigger and get one again. As we collect, we learn. We learn how to identify watches that we will truly love and wear and we become more knowledgeable so that we know what we're looking at. And hopefully, as we look back, yeah, there may be some sadness, but hopefully not a whole lot of regret because we made right choices. Thanks for watching.